I'm Mike McCabe and I'm running for governor and I came back to the farm where I grew up to make the announcement and I grew up milking cows in that barn and harvesting crops out in those fields. I, I played as a kid in this yard and it's just places like this have been ignored by the people who are in charge at the Capitol for too long. And, and we've got to get our government working for regular people and not just the people can, who can afford to have lobbyists represent them at the Capitol, not just the people who can make huge political donations, but people who live in places like this. They need representation. They don't have it today. It's my goal to give it to them. The state's strategy for decades now has been corporate welfare, that you shower tax breaks and state subsidies on a few, and you hope that some of what they're given will trickle down to the rest of the population. And I think you do the opposite. Instead of trying to build a sturdy economy from the top down, you build it from the bottom up. But you know some state someday will be the first to be able to claim to be 100% powered by renewable energy. It should be Wisconsin's goal to be that state. By restructuring our tax system and just applying that common sense rule that if a program doesn't work, you get rid of it, we can have the, the resources that we need to pay for health care for all and debt-free education and internet to every household. Though that would empower five million people in this state to do much more for themselves and for each other than showering corporate welfare on a few thousand people. We're dead last in the country in new business startups three years running. And the reality is that it's small business that creates most of the new jobs. And it's small business that I think will, will be the foundation of a really sturdy economy where people can work and be in the middle class. Places like this, who work in places like this barn. What government does should be done for the whole of society. And we've got this program called Badger Care, but it's available to very few people in Wisconsin. And to me, Badger Care should be there for all badgers. It should be there for you just because you live in the state of Wisconsin. It should be there for everyone. We have to focus on what we love, not what we hate. We have to focus on what we're for, not what we're against. And if we do that, if we do that, I think we will give the people of Wisconsin a great gift, a great opportunity that they haven't been given in a very long time. Thank you so much. Wow, everybody. Wow, everybody. That was, uh, that was, uh, we get an echo there. Hang, hang on. Echo there. Hang on. That's my bad. <laughs> this is the first We the People in a while. I'm rusty. It's, it's been a while. Thank you all for being here. We kind of took a break uh, just to, you know, collect our, our energies. A lot going on in the progressive movement. And, uh, it's time to bring Mike McKay back, who was, that, that was a great campaign ad by Mike. And just, just before we're going to get into some stats before we talk about Mike and what's going on. He's got incredible stats on his original We the People. Go watch that. Uh, it's amazing. And we're going to sh show you what I mean. Um, we're talking Bernie Sanders, superstar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez type views, type uh, talking. And, and, and uh, I'm really excited to bring Mike back. Mike McCabe, thank you so much for joining us again on We the People. Thanks for having me. Great to be back. Yeah, yeah, I really like that campaign ad. It was, uh, it, it was, uh, it's nice. There's nothing negative about it. There's nothing attacking. What you said at the end was really very Bernie. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that whole support what you love, you know. Don't. Hey, Laura. Hey. <laughs> Uh -oh. hey everybody, before we get I'm into the, center. are yeah. you? Yeah. Before we get into the the discussion with Mike, Laura is here to uh, engage with you in chat. Laura, tell them uh, how to engage with us and Mike. Mm -hmm. well, this is an engagement broadcast, so you have the unique opportunity to ask questions of our guest right now in the middle of the interview. So if you have a burning question for Mike, just put it in the chat and either write the word question all in caps or tag me some way that I can see it because I'm actually trying to listen to the interview. And we will stop a couple times in the show and uh, ask those questions of Mike. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kendra and Barbara and Jeff and Dennis. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you all. Welcome back. 18 people watching right now. Mike, Wisconsin. It's been in the news for lots of reasons. <laughs> You've been on the campaign trail, and I'm seeing some incredible stats. Um, before I show you what I was talking about in Greenmont, just how's it been? 
Oh, it's been a remarkable journey so far. I, I announced my candidacy back in September of last year. And since that time, we've traveled almost 90,000 miles all across the state of Wisconsin to every nook and cranny of our state, uh, reaching out to voters and have held hundreds of, of events. And, and I've, I've probably uh, participated in at least 30, maybe close to 40 candidate forums in every part of the state. Uh, so it, it's just been nonstop and, and particularly uh, an awful lot of time in the car. Uh, but, the, you know, I, I won't lie to you. It gets old uh, traveling that many miles, but the stops are, have been fantastic. The response to our campaign has been unreal. You know, we joke that if, if we could just ar somehow arrange a sit down meeting with a million people, we could have a one day campaign and I think we'd win this thing. Wow. But I mean, I, I don't just I, I don't. I believe you, let's put it that way, because I see the numbers in our own stats. I'm just, uh, it's just awesome. You, we were talking in Green Room about uh, a debate that just happened and the process that was going on with our revolution, working parties. Tell everybody about that, because I think that's really awesome. Yeah, it's a, co a cooperative uh, arrangement between our Wisconsin revolution and, and then the Working Families Party, and they call it Wisconsin's Choice. And what they've done is they've had all a whole bunch of forums all around the state invited people to come in they've they've also done virtual forums online and and recorded uh, comments from all the candidates nice wisconsin of course had a huge field of candidates on the democratic side initially uh, there were 17 or 18 announced candidates in, in on the democratic side for governor uh, and the there was a first round of voting for this wisconsin's choice process online that narrowed the field to nine. And then a second round of voting got it down to four. And then that final four just took part in a forum last night. And, and uh, we, had a, we had a debate behind the, the four finalists, the, the people who were really seen as the most progressive options in this race. What their aim is, is to eventually have this third and final round of voting identify what they call a people's champion a candidate who would really represent uh, the, the hopes for progressive uh, progress in Wisconsin. And, and uh, so I'm right in that mix. And that's a great feeling. That's awesome. That's it's awesome for two reasons. One, I'm glad you're in the mix because quite frankly, I think you're fantastic and your message is excellent. Um, two, uh, it's good to see the unity and the planning instead of organizations pitting progressives against each other. Right. And I think we're learning that lesson the hard way. We certainly did in Oregon with our primary. We had a number of progressives that should have been running in different races instead of fighting for the same Senate seat. Right. Um, I don't know if you if you had recognized that kind of problem in the past with our progressive movement as well. Well, you know, I think the biggest problem here in Wisconsin is that is that you just had this impulse for for quite some years of of the Democratic Party trying to clear the field for a single candidate. Yeah. And 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 then try to raise a, a huge amount of money to to run negative ads against Scott Walker. And of course, our current governor, Scott Walker, has been elected three times to that office. And and uh, he's faced candidates who who really didn't inspire or excite voters. Uh, he, the field was cleared for them. So they had a clear shot at Walker. But they ended up they ended up not gaining traction. And and. Scott Walker has gotten almost an identical percentage of the vote every time, either 52 or 53 percent in every one of the three elections that he's won. So this time is shaping up differently. There, there's a very uh, hotly contested primary election coming up on August 14th yeah. on the Democratic side. There's been a big field of candidates, but but there are some who are definitely uh, surfacing as the ones to beat. And 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 I'm I'm uh, thrilled to say that I'm one of those candidates who's been rising in the polls and gaining traction and. And, uh, and I'm, I'm in really good shape here. Absolutely. You, you, I mean, you, you really are pulling well, like neck and neck with Walker. And, and that's without recognition. That's yeah, the amazing thing is that I'm just becoming known to voters now that people are just getting to know me. But the response has been terrific. So in the latest Marquette University poll, and that's the poll that the media pays the most attention to in Wisconsin, uh, they did head to head comparisons. They, you know, they did head to head matchups. Uh, with the governor and of all the candidates in the Democratic field, I was running strongest uh, head to head against Scott Walker. And I, I had risen all the way to second place overall in the polls. Uh, you know, I started as a virtual unknown uh, yeah. and then 
have risen to second place in the polls behind behind the person who had the most uh, inherited advantage, uh, just in terms of name recognition starting out. And there, but I'm even running stronger head to head uh, in the polls uh, against Walker than than even that presumptive front runner. So right. So all those signs are great, but I think the thing that that is a, a truer indication to me is the fact that we've got over 2,500 volunteers across the state now wow. who've come up, who've come out of the woodwork and are taking matters into their own hands in every part of the state and are reaching out neighbor to neighbor and, and connecting with voters. That's the thing that I think is most thrilling. It, it, that's the, the best indication. We don't have big money on our side, uh, but in, when it comes to people power, ours is the richest campaign in the race by far. That That's very encouraging to hear. Because I know you're not going to beat Walker with cash. No, no. Right? And you're not going to beat the Democratic Party favorite by ca- with cash either. You know, it's... You know, and that's one of the interesting things is that two of the candidates with the most money failed to gain any traction. We, they were either stagnant in the polls or dropping. Wow. And they, two of the candidates with the most money in this race decided to suspend their campaigns and withdraw from the race. Wow, interesting. Uh, further narrowing the field. And so here I am with not having the big money on my side, not having a fraction of what those two candidates had in terms of money, and yet I was rising in the polls. They were either uh, stagnant or falling. They ended up pulling out, and I've risen to second place, and I'm running strongest against Walker head-to-head. So. Go figure. But I think that's a sign of our times. That's an indication of what's going on in American politics. And, you know, you mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, there's somebody who I think she was outspent, what, 10 to 1 yes. in her in her race. Yes. She was down in the in the last poll before the election by something like 36 percentage points. And she goes on and beats a House Democratic leader by 15 percentage points. That, that's a that's what's happening around the country. We're seeing that same kind of thing playing out here in Wisconsin. So I'm I'm feeling great about where we stand right now. That's that's awesome, and and yeah, the the, the money aspect of it tells me that even in a state that still thinks Walker's doing a good job, or you know a little bit according to the latest poll, that money in politics is an issue across the board, right? Oh, no, unquestionably, and and you don't have to believe polls to to get that feeling you just go out and talk to people regular folks on the street talk to republicans democrats independents alike and what you find is that people understand that our government has been taken hostage by big money interests all around this state Uh, that money power has a stranglehold on the capital and what that leaves us with is a government that works incredibly well for a wealthy and well-connected and privileged few at the very top, but it's failing the rest of us. And there are an awful lot of people who, who feel forgotten and written off and looked down upon. And, and there are just so many forgotten people living in places around this Wisconsin. And some of them live in the inner city. Some of them live way out in the country, like where I'm from. But I tell you, they, they, are, they are frustrated and they are hungry for a very different kind of leadership and a new politics. And I think that's what's drawing them to our campaign. That's awesome. That's awesome. I want to talk about more issues, but I, I promised that I, was, I want to show you all these stats because this is going to blow your mind. I want to show everybody this. If you're, and and the, by the way, the chat is very encouraged by this. And we needed something to pick us up, especially after this kind of the crap going on in Europe was was 45 right um i i want to show you these numbers this is you uh uh your we the people is at the top and uh alexandria ocasio cortez is is the one in red at the bottom and what i'm showing you there is the average view duration for our overall channel is uh generally in average it's around 11 minutes 49 seconds and about 20 percent of content your we the people from last was it August, 108 minutes is the average view duration. It's an hour long show. Uh, 113% watched is the is is the view of that. That's that's audience retention. Here's Bernie Sanders in relative audience retention. You see the little bumps up and down. Those bumps up and down are where people are more interested and less interested. And you can see the average line that I've highlighted in red. So Bernie Sanders is highlighting around average there. Here's Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's lines. Right, around average, you see the ups and downs where people are interested. Here's Mike. Do you notice a difference? 
Do you see where the average line is? <laughs> I, I, I went to go see. I'm going to go back and see what people were really paying attention to. I, I would have to watch the whole show. Yeah. That's phenomenal. That tells me that your message is resonating. <laughs> and, and that's just since last December. That's not, not, actually not even a year. Is it? Yeah, you're right. So here the, 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 you can see the blue line at the far back is the Ocasio video, when, uh, We the People. And, and there's about 250 views to start, which was, uh, that's typical. And then you can see it drops down to almost nothing. You, Mike's We the People started there with the, the orange, a little more modest, but you can see it has more sustained activity over the entire time. And then you can see at the very end there, that's when Joanne Reed discovered Ocasio-Cortez right there. All right. So that's, I'm just, you are competing well, with Bernie primary, Sanders. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's, those are killer numbers, man. Those are insane yeah. numbers. So yeah. well done. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, well done. Yeah. I, I, I had to go with that. Do you got any questions from the audience yet, Laura? Yeah, yeah. Dennis uh, from Germany has a couple of questions. Let me ask them now if it's if it's okay with you. Absolutely. Um, two things. I I believe he was pulling some of these from uh, your previous interview. First, he said, "Would you support a state bank?" that would give grants and loans with no interest to support worker-owned businesses or other projects? Uh, interesting that that question gets asked because uh, those who know me know that here in Wisconsin, I helped start a group called the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and, mm -hmm. and ran that group as its director for 15 years. And, and primarily what we did is we exposed the influence of big money in politics and, and, uh, and corruption in Wisconsin government. And we worked for all kinds of democracy reforms from redistricting reform, voting rights, uh, all, all of those kinds of things. But during my time at the democracy campaign, I, I frequently blogged and, and spoke about the State Bank of North Dakota. Yes. Right. And, and held it up as a model that Wisconsin should take a really good look at mm -hmm. and, and how to keep our capital here in the state and keep it in the hands of the people of this state and use it to, to help benefit Wisconsin. And, and whether it's helping local farmers or, or helping entrepreneurs be able to, to gain a foothold and, and make some good things happen uh, in starting small businesses. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been fond of the model of the State Bank of North Dakota, North Dakota for yeah. many, many years. And, and have written and, and spoken about it often. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am very fond of that. And I would love to see Wisconsin uh, take, take on that uh, task of, of building that here in our state. And you know, you know, there's a candidate for state treasurer who got in touch with me uh, about her run for that office. And one of the things I said is, is you know, you, you, should, you should go out there and, and talk about a state bank. Uh, you know, and that that would be a perfect role for the mm -hmm. for the state treasurer who has had that office has had its duties really stripped by ruling Republicans. And 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 uh, and we actually had a statewide referendum recently about whether to abolish the elected state treasurer's office. And wow. the people of, and the people of Wisconsin were were propagandized heavily about how useless this office was and how it should be abolished. Mm -hmm. But the people said no. They wanted to keep it. And now there are a number of candidates running for that office, and and I've and I've said, look, it would be a great role for the state treasurer to take on, is to lead the way in terms of of the formation of a state bank here in Wisconsin. I love that idea. Okay, so that's a huge yes. Wonderful. Yes. So, and I think, did you have a slide you wanted to pull in at this point, John? I saw, I saw you had one. Not for this. this I was I was looking ahead. Did, did Dennis have a second question? Yes, he did. Um, uh, he, Dennis and Dennis is, is uh, watching from Germany, where it's very late at night or early in the morning. So, hi, Dennis. Well, Dennis he's, he's Thanks for staying awake. Yeah. Staunch. International um, audience. De Germany. Guess what? They're really concerned over there in Europe about what's going on here. Yeah. Understandably. Yeah. yeah. Oz, so thank you. Asks, Hang on. Oh, ten, oh, that's right. Ten bucks from Oz. Thank you, Oz, in the live chat. Appreciate that. For so, Mike's audience retention numbers. <laughs> that's what he's donating that for. Appreciate Yay. that. This is a uh, user-supported network, everybody. Yeah. Just like it's a people-supported campaign for Mike, everybody here is taking small donations to survive uh, mm -hmm. and change our government. So thank you to everybody who could donate mm -hmm. to us and donate to Mike. Right? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm sorry, Laura. This please. Is, uh, next question. Um, Mike, are you still standing by that you will not move into the governor's mansion and only get paid what the average worker makes? 
Yeah, I, I'm still standing by that. I said from the very beginning of the campaign that if elected, I will not move into the governor's mansion. I, I live in a 1400 square foot home, which is actually the biggest house I've ever lived in in my life. Wow. It doesn't feel right to me to move into a 20,000 square foot mansion just for winning an election. And, and, and besides, I really think, and this is a heartfelt belief of mine that I've had for a long time. I think governors should be servants and not masters. And, and to me, that puts a governor under the people, not above them. And so I, again, I think uh, for winning an office like the governor's office to then move into a mansion, I think uh, just doesn't feel right to me. So I'll, I'll continue to live in my own home. Uh, and, and then I, I also said that I will be paid $1 less than the average Wisconsin worker makes. That, that's a commitment of mine and I will hold to that commitment because again, I, I, I don't feel right about taking that full salary of the governor. I, I feel like um, uh, I, I need to lead by example and I need to practice what I've preached all these years. So uh, it's, it's something that I started out with at the beginning of the campaign and I hold to it today. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome, thank you for that. Very good. Yeah, and uh, thank you for the questions. Dennis, mm -hmm. I see Expanding Electrons has a question, uh, and we're t it's talking about drugs. We'll get there. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. I want to, I wanna, because we just did the live stream of Bernie Sanders uh, about income inequality and talking about fighting for a living wage, and uh, believe it or not, I don't know if you caught any of that, Mike, but none of the CEOs showed up. It was, uh -huh. it was surprising. They, they, none mm -hmm. of them were there. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at your website. We got this. Uh, I'm going to show this slide here. Thank you to the volunteers with Uphill Media that takes so much time, uh, including German volunteers, to make these, uh, this content for our show. It says, McCabe charts five-year path to living wage for all workers. Talk to me about Tell us about that. What is this path? Well, I want Wisconsin to commit itself to erasing the term working poor from our vocabulary. I, I want our state's goal to be eliminating that phrase. Uh, and what that means is that if you work, you belong in the middle class. And what that means is that there's gotta be a living wage for every worker and healthcare for all, debt-free education and job training for everyone, high-speed internet everywhere. But you know, one of the things I've said all along is that our, our, our minimum wage should be $15 an hour. And what I've done is put forward a, a plan that that does uh, put us on a path to getting to that $15 an hour minimum wage in our state within five years. The first year I would bring Wisconsin's minimum up to the uh, up to where the, our neighbors are. Both Minnesota and Michigan have boosted their minimum wages. They're right in around 950 an hour. We're stuck at the, uh, we've kept wages as low as federal law allows here in Wisconsin. 725 an hour is our minimum wage. I want to bring it up to 950 the first year and then and then continue boosting it each year until we get to $15 an hour after 5 years. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean and and that's really let's just be honest about that. $15 an hour is a compromised minimum wage if if it really, right? We we we're, we're we're being nice about going there. Don't you agree? Oh, you know, and I, there was just a report came out here in our state that said that those people working at the current minimum wage of 725 an hour need three jobs to afford housing. Okay. So you have to have three, three jobs to be able to afford housing. So yeah, you know, to, to really afford housing, you've got to, you, you've got to get up there to, you know, 20 some dollars an hour in our state. And, and uh, so obviously we need to significantly boost the wage floor that of course will have ripple effects all through the, the wage scale and, and it will help boost wages for everybody in, in, all, in all areas of our economy. So that, that's something that we absolutely have to do. When you've got to have three jobs to be able to have a roof over your head, that's disgraceful and that's certainly not what I consider to be the Wisconsin way. Uh, so I, everywhere I go, I talk about what I call geyser economics. We've got to We've got to stop feeding the rich and showering tax breaks and state subsidies on a few at the very top. Uh, economic prosperity does not trickle down, it gushes up. And so where, wherever I go, I talk about geyser economics and the need to use our resources as a state to empower close to 6 million people who live here in Wisconsin to do more for themselves and for each other and to get them the ability to 
uh, we need to stoke in demand. We need to put money in, in the pockets of working people when we do that. They, they have a habit of spending it. They don't do what rich people do when they get more. They don't stash it in tax havens in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands. They don't pad their net worth with it. They spend it. And when they spend it, somebody's got to sell what they want to buy. And that stimulates the economy. And, 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 and that's, that's the, the approach to economic development that I want Wisconsin to embrace. And that's a 180 degree about face from the way Wisconsin's been trying to do it uh, for a, a whole bunch of years now. And here we are in this state, uh, Wisconsin currently so far in the 21st century uh, leads the nation in shrinkage of the middle class. We've got levels of economic inequality not seen in our state since the Great Depression. We're dead last in the nation in new business startups for the past three straight years. Wow. Uh, this this state is floundering economically, and it's because we're trying to p politically manipulate supply and create a sturdy economy from the top down instead of stoking demand from the ground up. And uh, that's got to change. And that's a that's a that's the centerpiece of of this whole campaign for governor is to is to empower working people and and. Uh, and deal with that issue of inequality in our state. Wonderful, wonderful, and and yeah, I, I it, we have to start somewhere. And I think it's you know as progressive as we want to be, um, uh, we need to you know you you've got an incremental process to get it up to a spot, which I think is a nice compromise compared to not you know to where the the other side would have us believe. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, every state that's increased wages has seen economic boom they haven't seen like a failure businesses haven't run crazy leaving right well you know that that's the thing we've got to change the conversation because there's been this propaganda for decades if not generations that that raising wages will kill jobs right that raising wages will hurt the economy and people have been propagandized to that effect for a long time when in fact low wages are a killer for the economy they suppress demand they inhibit sales they, they, when you when you suppress wages, you hurt the economy and hurt it badly. You hold back economic. Wisconsin's a great example of that. I mentioned that our neighbors to the west and east, Minnesota and Michigan, have both substantially increased their minimum wages. We haven't seen any Minnesota and Michigan businesses fleeing to Wisconsin <laughs> to, to set up shop here no. to, to take advantage of our our minimum wage, which is as low as federal law allows. So, you know, we've, we've got to change the whole conversation, challenge that propaganda, and put forward a vision for our state that is starkly different. That, that kind of vision has been missing. That conversation has been absent in our state. I, I take that on as a real responsibility of leadership. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's, it, that needs to happen. And, and to, to tie in with that, we, we worry about... Uh, um, businesses fleeing or overburdening small businesses as we increase wages. Uh, and I'm looking at, uh, uh, you mentioned in your video at the beginning, you talked about badger care and how it should be available to all badgers, which I thought was very cute. Talk, talk about how, because they're interconnected, right? If, if you're going to, you have to deal with health care if you're going to raise wages and deal with employees, right? Yeah, look, look, I, I want a national solution ultimately. I, I want a single payer Medicare for all approach in America, but I'm not running for Congress. I'm not, I'm sure not running for president. I'm running for governor. And so my job is to try to make Wisconsin a national model for the rest of the country to follow. And, and we do have this program called Badger Care, but remarkably few people are eligible currently. And so what I've said is that we've got a, we've got a, correct two mistakes that Wisconsin has made and then do a third thing that is is contingent on those mistakes being corrected. We've got to take the federal Medicaid expansion money that was offered but turned down by the Walker administration here wow. in Wisconsin. Yeah. That could make more than 80,000 more people eligible for Badger Care and, and get them that health insurance. Then the second mistake we've got to correct is is Wisconsin's choice to not set up its own state health insurance exchange under the Affordable Care Act. Wow. And, do it, and doing that would then free us to take that third step, which is making Badger Care a public option, putting it on that state health insurance exchange and letting anybody choose to enroll regardless of income. Let anybody buy into Badger Care. Now, the latest figures I've seen show that Badger Care's overall cost is close to 40% lower than what's out there on the private health insurance market on average. 
and it's better insurance. There's no 7,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 annual deductible. It starts paying medical expenses from the first office visit and the overall cost is about 40% lower than what's out there on the private market. So you put that on a state health insurance exchange and that is one heck of an option for a whole bunch of people who are scared to death of getting sick and are afraid to go to the doctor because they can't afford to. And creating financial security, economic stability for people here in the state is not just about making sure we've got a living wage for every worker. It's also about creating health security. It's also being able to uh, make sure that everybody's got coverage that enables them to go to the doctor when they're sick. Healthcare is a right, it's not a privilege. And we gotta keep saying that until and until that becomes the dominant narrative in our country too. Absolutely. There's a lot of people in the chat that would like Badger Care as well, by the way. Just to let huh. you know. Yes. This. I mean, I, Absolutely. I like it. Hey, listen, listen, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. I come from a farming background. I actually wasn't covered by any form of health insurance until I was 22 years old. And the reason is because my family made the decision to forego health insurance in order to keep our farm profitable. That's the financial decision my family made. And so we we just didn't go to the doctor. You, unless you had a limb hanging from a few strands, you just didn't go to the doctor. And <laughs> you just, you dealt with things at home because, and I wasn't actually in, insured until the age of 22, but that's not unusual. That is not an exceptional story. That's a common story for many people, certainly in the family farming business. Hmm. There's, but then there's also a whole bunch of people out there who've got wonderful ideas and want to start a new business, but they're tethered to a job that is the way that their family gets health insurance. Now, if they were able to explore an app, an option as affordable and as, and as qu a, a quality form of insurance like Badger Care, if they were able to, to do that, they could let go of that job they've been tethered to that they, that they don't want to they don't want to do that job anymore. They really want to follow their dreams and take their ideas and, and start that new business. They could do it, and that would help stimulate Wisconsin's economy. So we're holding back our economy because of this crazy health care system that we've got. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. And, it, and it, you know, if we, we a lot of people chat saying we need single payer, we, we definitely need to get there, but we need to open up Medicare for all first, right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the step way, right? Yeah. Oh, I want I want a single payer Medicare for all system across this country. I, I think a national solution is the answer. And I just want to create as much political pressure uh, and provide as much leadership at the state level to to advance this debate and, and to and to give other states a, a model to follow. And I, I think Badger Care for All here in Wisconsin would be a, a tremendous step forward and and Look, there are an awful lot of people out there who are very vulnerable. They they can't afford to go to the doctor, and and this would really be a a lifesaver that we could throw to them. Well, I agree, and I think most of the most of the ninety nine percent would agree. I know that Scott Walker's donor base does not agree. This is true I, enough. I just want to show you this list, everybody. When you talk about money in politics, this guy is loaded. Um, construction, six million. The uh, health professionals, three, and then two, and then insurance with another two. That's a lot of millions coming out of the healthcare industry. So my guess is they're going to be fighting any concept of anything that's going to downsize them, right? Oh, of course, and. You know, those those numbers uh, are numbers that I compiled for years as director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. We followed the money and and we shined light on the, the money that flows in Wisconsin. And what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, one half of one percent of the American population supplies over two thirds of all the political money out there. And the other thing I can tell you is that when you look at that tiny segment of society, that has the habit of, of making these huge donations. What they want our government to do is vastly different from what the rest of us want our government to do. And they get their way on every issue we care about. We've got to break that the grip of that money power. And, and when Democratic candidates or progressive candidates chase fat cat donors from coast to coast, we're playing Scott Walker's favorite game and we're playing it by his rules. We have to challenge and overcome money power with people power. 
it takes a movement to beat this machine. There is no way we will beat Scott Walker with money. He will have vastly more than anyone. Right. Not a single candidate in the Democratic field, not even those, the, the two with some, some of the biggest uh, sums of money who ended up dropping out because they weren't gaining traction. None of them raised even a tenth of what Scott Walker raised in 2017. All of us Democratic candidates combined didn't raise a third of what Walker had. So we're not going to beat him with money. We've got to beat him with vision and with ideas and with people power. And the thrilling thing about this is our campaign now has over 2,500 volunteers who've come out of the woodwork all across the state and are, are out there pounding the pavement and, and, and campaigning neighbor to neighbor and, and doing direct voter outreach. And, and it's an amazing thing to watch this uh, this citizen army that is assembled here in Wisconsin. Uh, it keeps my batteries recharged every day, just <laughs> hear, hearing the stories and, and seeing the evidence of what they're doing in, in every part of our state. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. And before we ask Laura if there's any other questions, I just want to I want to connect with you on that. It's a total sideline. We cheer each other on, and I say this to people in the audience, I say this to Mike, I say this to all the volunteers working this, in this. We're not going to get any praise anywhere else. This is we have to do this for each other. We have to say, yay, good job. And we have to support each other because this is all we got right here. And so I love hearing Mike talk about that and, and feeling uplifted by going out on the streets because I get the same thing from you guys and I get the same thing from doing these interviews. Right. Oh, you, you know what? I, I've I've had people come up to me at events and say, you know what? I've never made a political donation in my life. This is the first check I've ever written to a a candidate for office. And then I, I've had people uh, come up and say, you know, I've never gone door to door. I don't think I can do it, but I'm willing to try. And, nice. and if people are pushing themselves outside of their comfort zones and in ways that are really inspiring. And we have this habit at events. We, we have these brown bags that we fill with uh, a few pieces of literature. And, and on, the, on the brown bag, it, 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 it's just written, tell 10. And then it says this election's in the bag. And you know, if you if if you're willing to commit to just talking to ten people, that's cool. that's what that's what's gonna make this this victory possible. And we've now distributed over twenty six hundred of those bags. Wow. And I can't tell you how many people have come up and said, you know, I don't I don't actually think I'd feel comfortable approaching ten people, but I'm willing to give it a try. And then I've had people come back uh, to a, a some future event. And, and say, give me some more of those bags. I can do this. I, I, you know, I tried it. I can do this. And I, and, and they, and you can tell they're really, they, they really feel liberated from what they felt was holding them back in the past. They feel like they can engage in ways that they'd never done in their lives. And that, is, that's the best part of this whole campaign. That's freaking awesome. That is awesome. So nice to hear. So good to hear. And uh, the audience is, is uh, right there with you. Laura, I see we have some questions. You want to? Yeah, just, uh, Julie was just asking about uh, debates. Are there any scheduled debates with your opponents coming up now? That just, had, just had one last night yeah. with, the, with the final four candidates in what's called the Wisconsin's Choice Process, which is mm -hmm. trying to identify a people's champion. We also had a televised debate, a real traditional debate with all eight remaining Democratic candidates that was televised in the Milwaukee and Green Bay TV markets and also on Milwaukee Public Radio and, and was streamed elsewhere in the state online. Nice. Uh, and, and, uh, and that was a very traditional debate uh, in, a, in a big auditorium and candidates standing behind podiums. And, and uh, you know, and I've probably done somewhere between 30 and 40 candidate forums all across Wisconsin since starting this this campaign. And sometimes it's been as few as three or four of the candidates, sometimes as many as 13 candidates in those forums. And wow. we've had every imaginable kind of format. Sometimes it's been a speed dating kind of, of, <laughs> of process where the candidate goes to a table and visits with some voters and then moves on to the next table. Sometimes it's been more traditional kind of debate format, uh, but we've had a lot of different uh, events all across the state of Wisconsin. People have been given a lot of opportunities to, to hear from the candidates. Um, and then we've held hundreds of our own events. So like I said at the beginning, uh, you know, I, I've traveled almost 90,000 miles now across the state of Wisconsin. And Dang. a big reason is because I'm not taking any single donation over $200. 
and uh, wow. individuals can legally give up to twenty thousand dollars to a candidate for governor. But but I, I see those huge donations for what they are. They're legal bribes, and and I I understand the strings that are attached to those kind of donations. So we've decided that we're going to do it with with small dollar contributions and and uh, and then a whole lot of volunteer time and effort and and uh, and so far that recipe is working for us. We're we're gaining public support. We're even though voters are just now starting to get to know me, I'm running neck and neck with Governor Walker in the latest poll, and and I'm running strongest as I said um, uh, against Walker uh, of any of the Democratic candidates in the field. But I don't have big money on my side. I'm doing this with no single donation over two hundred dollars no it's phenomenal and what you what you have is the people on your side and that's that's obvious and that's that's how uh alexandria ocasio cortez won she had the support of the people she had the support of progressive organizations and they work together and you know i just love it and something that i you know i hope we're going to get back to some more questions jilly love thank you for the 999 i appreciate that and super chat glad you discovered it and i'm glad your cat's alive um you know uh, uh, the the support I, you've built a force. And this is what's really cool. We've got all these people that have built a force around them. Gale Force in California, Ocasio Cortez has a force in New York. You've got a force now in Wisconsin. Regardless of what happens, that force can continue to do work. And that's, oh, it has to. That's powerful. Oh, it has to. You know, this is, this, this is not something that, when I talk about the fact that we need a movement to beat the machine, it can't be a movement that only lasts. Uh, for the duration of one election campaign, right? It has to be a it has to be a movement that lives on beyond that because the forces that have have got our state government here in Wisconsin in a stranglehold, uh, those those forces built over the course of decades, and and we're not gonna we're not gonna break that grip and get regular people in the driver's seat of our government in in one election. No. We, in one victory won't do it. This is this is something that that I've worked on for a long time, although not as a candidate for office, but rather as an independent watchdog and reform advocate. But now that I'm taking that effort into an election for governor and hopefully into the governor's office itself, uh, I'm well aware of the fact that 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 movement has to live on. And, you know, and, and look, I, I'm taking the long view here. I, I've taken the risk as a candidate for governor of even saying that Wisconsin should be the first state in America to experiment with a basic income program. Now, most people in Wisconsin don't know what basic income is. And oh. I think the initial response for a lot of people is, is negative. They, they, they just, you know, they, they take, they, their assumption is that that probably sounds like just a, a bit, one big handout and, and, a, and an encouragement for people to just sit on their couches. And I tell you, it, I really feel strongly that in 10 or 15 years, it's going to be considered a necessity in this country and people are going to be clamoring for it. But we've got to start the conversation now. We've got to begin familiarizing people with the concept of a basic income program. And I want to start small with a, with a, a small scale test run, an experiment here in Wisconsin. I want Wisconsin to be the first state in the nation to do such an experiment. And that, that's what leadership should be all about, is changing conversation, getting people to think outside the box, think about things that maybe they're not familiar with, because this is something that is going to be necessary eventually. We, we're seeing so much employment being automated out of existence, robots taking away jobs in factories. But what happens when the full force of driverless vehicles hits? What happens to all the truck drivers and the taxi drivers and the bus drivers? when they're thrown out of work, that's when we're gonna to have to have a, a program in place that is going to provide economic stability and financial security for very vulnerable workers who are watching their employment automated out of existence. If we're gonna maintain social cohesion and stability and, and not see just obscene levels of economic inequality become, become cemented in place in our state, we're gonna to have to take really significant steps. I think the time is now to start the conversation in Wisconsin about a basic income program. And that's one place where I stand alone among all the candidates on the, in the Democratic field. Nobody else is willing to touch this with a 10-foot pole, but I think it's time to do this. So whether it was 
uh, whether it was uh, me going out there and calling for Badger Care for All, and I was the first candidate to do it. Well, now virtually the entire field has embraced that. I was also the first <laughs> candidate to say we should fully legalize marijuana. Yay. And 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 then, and now virtually the entire Democratic field has embraced that. So we're changing the conversation. That's beautiful. In this but so far, nobody else has been willing to to bite on the idea of experimenting with basic income. But I think I think that that's what leadership has got to be all about. Congre- I, that's awesome. I'm glad you're pushing forward because you got to start the conversation that it's not giving away free stuff, right? You, 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 you know, you know. To me, one of the things that we've got now, and and this is the this is the conversation I have with people when they say, "Well, that just looks like one big handout to me." I said, "Well, wait a second. What we've got right now are a whole bunch of programs that really are poverty traps. You have to be poor to to be to get the help, and then you have to stay poor to keep the help. And you reach this point where if you earn $1 more, you're ineligible for that assistance, and you're going to lose hundreds, if not thousands of dollars if you earn $1 more. And so the, the incentive is to cut back on your hours or to stop working. You know, and so whether it's food stamp eligibility or housing assistance eligibility, you got to be poor to get the help, and then you got to stay poor to keep the help. Right. With basic income, you're free from that. Right. It, it enables you to. It, it builds a platform so that you can step onto the ladder a few rungs up. It gives you some security and some stability. Then you can pursue some some more education or job training to get ahead. You can climb the ladder and you can keep right on climbing. The harder the, you work, the better off you are. Nobody is gonna live on the basic income, but that basic income is gonna provide the cushion that will help a low wage worker survive while they're, while they're looking at ways to climb the ladder. This, this is something that I think is gonna be a, a necessity in this country in, de- in 10 to 15 years as the full force of automation and driverless vehicles and robots and factories, as that really hits, this is gonna become a necessity, but we've gotta start planning and discussing this now if we're gonna be ready to, to make that transition. Or we're gonna see some really grotesque levels of inequality cemented in place in our society. I don't wanna see that happen. Well, we're, I think we're there, but yeah, it's gonna get even worse. Uh, it will get worse. You know, it's going to get even worse. And, 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 oh, and, and, and look, I, I said that Wisconsin right now has levels of economic inequality not seen in our state since the Great Depression. So we're in the thick of this now. But then think about what happens as the truck drivers are replaced by those driverless vehicles and the taxi drivers and the bus drivers. We're talking about millions of people in this country who drive for a living. And that employment could all vanish. It could disappear. And that hasn't happened yet. Nope. So we already have a major problem with, uh, with income and, and economic insecurity in our in, uh, inequality in our state and in our country. But that will get so much worse unless we take measures to deal with it. And I, I want to get Wisconsin out in front of that debate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad. And I, I want to address two things. We've got 10 minutes left probably going to run over anyway because we started late and it's just i could talk to you for hours phenomenal <laughs> very knowledgeable the audience is having a great time and i want to find that if we have any like really great questions from the audience you want to ask uh laura live and go down no i saw the chat going off is there anything you'd like to hit well and i think you touched on this a little bit of cannabis but um Yay. would expand that do you support the de- decriminalization of all drugs yeah, we've de- we've got to totally relook at drug laws in our country because they've proven ineffective, they've proven counterproductive, they are clearly racially discriminatory. You take a, a second marijuana possession charge in Wisconsin, for example, is a felony. You you go to prison for a second marijuana possession charge, but you only go to prison if you live in a zip code like five three two zero six. Uh, which is an inner which is an inner city Milwaukee zip code which happens to be the most heavily incarcerated zip code in America. You get that second marijuana possession charge there you go to prison. You get that second charge in a lot of zip codes in Wisconsin you don't you, you're not put behind bars. So it's racially discriminatory, it's ineffective, it's counterproductive. Our our drug laws have been a failure and so we, they they have become a driving force for mass incarceration. And, and that has left us in a position, Wisconsin, of having a budget 
that spends more on prisons than the entire university system. We spend more in Wisconsin locking people up than we do unlocking the potential of our population. I would think that's a national number. I mean, you know, we, we could send all our prisoners to college for cheaper right now. Yeah, and I can't speak. I, I, I live and breathe uh, the challenges that we have here in Wisconsin. I can't speak uh, for the figures nationally, but I can tell you. Wisconsin does have a state budget that spends more on prisons than the whole university system in our state. That is a tragedy for our state. It's a, it, it, re, what we're doing is we're paying more and more and more for failure, which makes us less and less capable of investing in success. And, and that, that is a tremendous wasted opportunity for our state. And so we got to deal with that. And, and, you know, my goal is to cut our prison population in half. And that is a realistic and achievable goal because all you have to do is look across the border to the West and there's a state, Minnesota, that imprisons half as many people as Wisconsin. And yet our two states have virtually identical crime rates. So locking up twice as many people in Wisconsin has not reduced crime. It hasn't led to less crime in our state. It's only doomed us to a budget that spends more on prisons than the university system. Well, it makes a lot of money. And quite frankly, in this economy if you want to have a steady job prison is the way to go right you get a place to and sleep that, you get food you get a, a job it, you know it's horrible but it's more better than you know what a what a sad commentary on our times yeah. when when uh, when when that is a reality for far too many people it absolutely is i want to one question i have is you're talking to constituents you're walking around i mean obviously you're meeting people that are republicans as you're knocking on doors and they're and they're they're you know behind Trump or behind Walker, or whatever it is, when you talk to them about um, uh, basic income or increasing wages or anything that would involve, you know, money that they don't know where it's going to come from. And you mentioned, like, I've got on your website here, I just want to bring this up because, you know, <laughs> McCabe calls for ending two state subsidies, benefiting select few and investing in community prosperity. When, when you talk about subsidies for corporations, what kind of a response do you get? They- well, people don't people don't agree with me about everything, but you'd be amazed how much common ground we can find. And you know what? I was at, I was actually approached by a Trump voter and asked to announce my candidacy from from the farm that he that he runs. And and in the barn was still an in the barn was still an old Veterans for Bush sign was hanging. <laughs> And th- this guy is a, a Trump voter, and he said, I love the way you're talking, and I would be honored if you'd come out to the farm and announce your candidacy for governor from out here. Wow. And, and, and so, you know what? I, I tell you, you, when you have conversations with, with, with Trump voters, with my hometown, the little town, our farm was five miles n- outside of a little town named Curtis. Only 200 people live there. But that town had the distinction in the last election for governor of giving Scott Walker his biggest percentage margin of victory of any community in the state. Walker won that town with 90 percent of the vote. And I after announcing my candidacy, I stopped by a cafe right there in Curtis and I went around from table to table and nobody told me to, you know, get out of here with that kind of talk. Nobody told me to get lost. I had wonderful conversations. People don't agree with me about everything, but I think they respect the fact that I, that, that I uh, am passionate and, and I am straightforward with where I'm coming from. I don't pull any punches. I don't pretend to be anything I'm not. Uh, I think they respect that, that honesty and authenticity. And, and we find more common ground than you can imagine. And I, and I, I think that Democrats make a huge mistake writing off places like that and, and, and uh, no longer competing there. We've got to compete in places like that. And I think we can compete successfully. Oh, absolutely. And I, 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 you know, I used to think it was the Democrats not wanting to compete in those areas. And what it really is is the Democrats conceding that they're okay with Republican power in a state. We're OK. With, and, and that's just not a that's not an attitude to have in a Democratic Party that wants to make progress. Right. Yeah. All, all I know is that a lot of these people have only been hearing from Republicans for a lot of years. Uh, and yet Clark County, the, the county that I grew up in, uh, that county used to be represented solidly by Democrats. And wow. now it, it, it votes overwhelmingly Republican. So I've watched that. I've watched my own neighbors go on a journey. And, uh, and I've watched them change their voting behavior over the years. 
Uh, but they, you know, in, in some cases, they haven't heard from a Democrat in a really long time. Well, I, I'm committed to making sure that that, that changes. Right. That's awesome. And, and just to be clear, everybody, the, the Democratic Party proper that we're talking about in Wisconsin, I mean, they, they had something to do with the debate that you were involved in. And they allowed you to speak, which was really cool. Right. But they, you haven't been they haven't reached out to you with open arms and said, we welcome your progressiveness and we'd love to support you. Right. Well, you know, it, it kind of depends on which Democratic Party you're talking about. When, really? When I think about <laughs> what I would regard as the, uh, what, what I would. When I talk about what I would regard as the state party establishment, the responses to my candidacy has been been cool. It's been it's been pretty chilly, and right. and I am sort of seen as a uh, as an unwelcome intruder. But but I'm okay with that because I think there needs to be some intrusion. But when you get out to the grassroots <laughs> level, when you go out to the county party meetings, especially as you go north in our state, then the reception has been delightfully warm. Uh, and I, I tell you, I, I've been welcomed with open arms from grassroots Democrats, particularly in the north of our state. Nice. And one of the thing, one of the things I've found in Wisconsin, uh, the farther north you go in our state, the more rural it gets. First of all, hmm. but the farther north you get, the the more intense the hunger for change becomes. Really? Uh, you know, pe- people are hungry for a a really different kind of leadership and a new politics in our state, but the hunger intensifies the farther north you go. That's awesome. That's, that's encouraging to hear. Honestly, that's good to know. I appreciate that. And a lot in the North woods have been sort of written off uh, by a, by a lot of politicians, especially on the democratic side for years now. But I'll tell you, there's something brewing out there in the North woods. Uh, the, the rural <laughs> is the, the rural areas of all of our States uh, have been neglected uh, for so long, which is why Republicans command it, right? And so, excellent. Just good on you. That's fantastic to hear. Laura, you got any last statements or things you want to bring up in the audience? You were laughing there. I did see uh, what was... Um, um, oh, as governor, would you cooperate with ICE and the Trump administration's policy on immigration? Hmm. I want Wisconsin to become a national model uh, for other states to follow in resisting national immigration policy. I want our state to set a tone that is welcoming and hospitable and, and uh, you know, and, and I, I, I do want Wisconsin to be, become part of the active resistance to current federal immigration policy. And one of the, one of the practical things that I hear from, from Latino groups everywhere I go one of the issues that they bring up right away is driver's licenses. Right. They they want to they want to be able to get driver's licenses, but they're scared to death to go to a division of motor vehicles office because they are afraid of being detained and deported. And so they want those DMV offices to be safe havens, and they want to be able to to get a driver's license and driver's training and insurance. And that's good for all motorists in Wisconsin. That'll just make our roads safer if we've got everybody with driver's licenses and training and insurance. And so I, I am committed to the idea of a, of a driver card pr- a program in Wisconsin that would be available to anyone, including undocumented immigrants, and, and, then, and then creating leadership that would make our Division of Motor Vehicles a safe haven where people could come and get that, that driver card without fear of being detained and deported. And then that's gonna take leadership by our state and it's gonna take active resistance to current federal immigration policy, but that's where I want Wisconsin to be. Look, our country has always benefited from immigration. We've always been made stronger as a nation by immigrant populations. We've never been made weaker. We've always been made stronger. We've gotta keep that in mind. We've gotta remember it and we've gotta move forward uh, with that in mind, that immigrant populations make our country better, not worse. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it, the narrative around that that's been pushed by the GOP and the Trump administration is horrific. Um, and and uh, I, I'm what I want to I want to narrow you down on this a little bit. I mean, before ICE, we had the Immigration Naturalization Service. ICE was a, a, a knee jerk reaction to 9-11. And uh, do you believe do you agree with the idea of abolishing the institution? Yeah, you know, ICE, of course, was part of the Homeland Security Act. And, and when, when that legislation was passed, that was the biggest single expansion of federal government authority in the last 50 years in America. Yeah. 
So when people on the Republican side talk about big government, the biggest single expansion of federal government power was done under the Bush administration with near unanimous support among Republicans in Congress. It was the biggest expansion of federal power in the last 50 years. That was the creation of the Homeland Security Department. And of course, ICE is part of, of, of that operation. I, I'm not running for Congress and I'm not running for president, so I'm not gonna be in a position to push the legislation that would do away with ICE and take us back to, right. to the immigration system that we had before. I certainly favor that and I certainly speak for that as a candidate for governor. Uh, uh, but what I wanna focus on as governor is how Wisconsin can take steps to actively resist the, the current trends in terms of federal immigration policy and be a leader in this nation in creating a, a, a hospitable and welcoming environment for immigrants. And just an example, uh, President Trump asked Governor Walker to send Wisconsin National Guard troops down to the border when they were, when they were separating kids from their parents down to the border. And Governor Walker sent Wisconsin National Guard troops. Uh, you know, if I were governor at that moment, I, I would say, President Trump, sorry, they ain't coming. Uh, in fact, we've had major flooding here in Wisconsin, particularly up in the north of our state. We've got roads washed out. I'm sending the National Guard up there to do uh, to do uh, uh, repair work uh, and and uh, and and flood rescue oper operations. Nice. Yeah. I mean, let's let's act humanely here. You do have power as governor to do to do things, control the National Guard. And, and I like the idea of being a resistance against uh, our Gestapo. It's basically an American Gestapo because they're not just they're not going after any immigrants. You're brown. Doesn't matter where your papers. They've been stopping people in Maine. It's on the highway. I mean, this is it's uh, out of control. So uh, I'm glad you've got to stand there. We're out of time. We've been running over. Uh, Laura Live and Good. Thank you so much for hanging out with the chat. Oh, my pleasure. As always, they were very well behaved today. Were they? Thank you, chat. Thank you for your mm -hmm. donations. Thank you for your quick questions. Mike, thank you so much for running. It's the hardest thing to do. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me back again. Absolutely. Great talking with you as always. Yeah. We'll be watching we'll be watching your, your primary night. We will. We will. Closely. Thank you. And, and, and once you win, I just want to make a shout out to uh, Walker. Uh, Scott, uh, we're happy to host the debate. All right have you on here we'll yeah. just talk and and love to do that if, you know if we ever get that opportunity but mike thank you so much uh where are you going to be what's coming up where are you going to be where can people get a hold of you well uh, they can go to governorbluejeans.com which is the campaign website and and a whole bunch of events are listed and and i'm on the road constantly but people can look right there and see when i'm going to be coming to a location near them that's awesome uh so so yeah governorbluejeans.com is the website to, to look and at all those links are in the description of the video that's that right and much much more please go there please share the links we've got links to mike's uh donation link to his website all that stuff please share this because there is nobody else we're not going to get any help from the net, the big networks. This is us. It's you. Uh, we're going out with a song today. Uh, usually with We the People, when we interview the candidate for the first time, we ask them to pick a song because it helps us get to know who they are. That's an easy one with Mike, right? He, he had the blue jeans. Uh, Marcus and I, when we go over the dossier that the, the volunteers take a lot of time to put together, all the slides and information that make this a good interview, right? We think about the candidate and what song would work. And um, Mike came across as a country boy grew up on a farm and and we were looking at tunes and uh, there's this one called uh, meet me where the crow don't fly uh, by the water tower bucket boys and it, it's a it's an interesting one it's got a country kind of blue grassy feel the reason we picked it was because the the term comes from um uh where the crow flies which is a, a sailing term because crows will not fly into bad weather and crows have an instinct as to where the bad weather is. So they, the sailors would let crows loose and go, go to them. And crows also don't like being in, they like finding land, getting to stability. All right. So uh, to me, this song is about going into the danger and fixing things. We know that's not what we know. There's, that's a problem. It's a storm. But we're going to head there because we've got to, we've got to face it. And there's going to be stability on the other end of that. And that's, that's why we picked this song for Mike. I can't thank him enough for running we need more progressives running we need to support our progressives we need to support the organizations that support our progressive candidates 
Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you. Laura, do we have any other We the People's booked yet? No, we're working on getting Jill Stein um, uh, scheduled for after the uh, their convention this weekend. We were going to try and do it before. Well, there you go. We've got a, we've got a few conversations going, but nobody booked. All right, nobody yet. Well, share this. Thank you, everybody. Right. 